sih ya. Oh. Ada nanti nanti. Ini yang lain dalam kita.
now there are 116 participants in the webinar room. more people are coming in for 130. So it's about 100 watching live. And we have lots of greetings, you know, from uh, our colleague from the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand. Just got in a greeting from Singapore. Oh. So really, would you like to start? Sorry? Yeah, you can say something to welcome our participant. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar on journal publication today. Uh, in our program today, we will have five distinguished speakers, three editors, and uh, two ELT uh, scholars who will be sharing their thoughts and ideas about journal publication. 
Uh, the agenda today, before we start, is for me to invite uh, Associate Professor uh, Supong Tanking Sirisin, the President of Thai TESOL and also Director of the uh, Language Institute of Tamasat University, to say a few words of greeting to everyone. Uh, Professor Supong, please. Uh, good morning from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, welcome to a Can Be Missed webinar co-hosted by Thailand TESOL Association and the Language Institute of Thammasat University. Uh, the topic of the webinar this morning, which is uh, publishing in mainstream journals, has attracted the attention of a large audience in the academia, particularly in the TESOL community. So as university lecturers, we need to publish our research mainly for professional development and to fulfill our university requirements to ensure that our publication is well accepted by readers and other scholars, we should consider publishing in mainstream journals, widely accepted in our fields. So this is so tough, right? Because you know, mainstream journals would accept only high quality research for their publications. And so that's why a lot of researchers turn to non-mainstream journals, which might be more lenient. In the fields of ELT or TESOL, which journal would we dream of publishing in then, uh, perhaps TESOL quality, right? But it's so difficult and challenging to publish in this journal, as you know. So what about other journals like System, RELC, and Second Language Writing? Are they so harsh they won't accept our manuscripts? Probably yes. And our papers you know, must be very well written. Uh, the research quality must also be very high and sophisticated. So are there any techniques or strategies for publishing in these journals? And are there any tips? The answers to this question will be provided by our guest speakers today. Mm -hmm. So they are all the editors or chief editors for the mainstream journals that are well known in our fields. And we also have with us today on the panel two researchers who will share the experience with publishing in good quality journals. So what we will gain from our webinar today will be very insightful and inspirational. We are looking forward to hearing some useful advice that will help us achieve our aim to reach the pinnacle of our profession. I'd like to thank all our distinguished speakers who are actually our lovely friends as well. And I'm grateful to our great friend, Dr. Willie Renanya, who initiated online webinar today. I hope all of you both attending in this webinar room and watching from YouTube live will find this session insightful and thought provoking. So let's get started. So now over to you, Ajahn Willy. Uh, thank you very much, Ajahn Supong. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ajahn Supong and I will be chairing uh, today's uh, uh, sessions. <clears throat> but before we start, I'd like to say hello to colleagues and friends in the audience, uh, colleagues from Thailand, so Adikap and uh, colleagues from the Philippines, Mabu Haipo and uh, Maraming Salamat, thank you very much. From Indonesia and Malaysia, Salamat Pagi, and from China, Ni Hao, Chao Sang Hao, and from the rest of the world, including Singapore, hey, good morning again. Uh, today's plan, we'll have two segments today. The first segment, in the first segment, we'll have the first three editors to share uh, their thoughts, their tips, and the uh, other matters related to journal publications. Uh, but let me just start by introducing the uh, three uh, journal editors to you. The first editor is Ai C. Lee. She is a professor in the Faculty of Education at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She is also currently chair of the uh, Department of Curriculum and Instruction. She is former editor of a Q1 journal uh, Journal of Second Language Writing, Elsevier. It's difficult to get in, but uh, I think she will share with us how some of the tips of, you know, on how we can get uh, published in that journal. Uh, she herself is a very well published scholar uh, specializing in second language writing. Uh, the second editor uh, is Dr. Mario. She is editor of the RLT Journal, uh, published by Sage UK. She is a very, very passionate language teacher educator who travels all over Southeast Asia to conduct teacher development courses 
two deserving teachers, uh, language teachers in the region. And the third editor is a former colleague of mine, Professor uh, Lawrence Zhang. He is Professor of Linguistics in Education at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, he is currently co-editor of System, another high profile journal, also very well published. And he is also a super, super friendly uh, scholar. He enjoys working with graduate students and currently he is supervising not one, not two, but 18 PhD students. I think Larry should share some of them with me. I can help you there. <laughs> uh, let me just introduce as well the other two speakers. Uh, both are scholars in their respective uh, field of specialization. Uh, the first one is Professor Kristin Goh. She is a renowned ELT scholar who specializes in second language oracy development. And she has published two very influential books on the teaching of speaking and also on the teaching of listening. Uh, she is currently director of NIE, so she works in the same place as I do. And she also holds the NTU President's Chair Professor of Education in Linguistics and Language Education. And last but not least, a fast emerging academic star from Tamasat University, uh, Professor Pichaya Mongkulhuti. Uh, she, is, she, is, she has published a few articles and later she will share with you some of the joy and also the frustration of trying to get published in a good journal. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should start now. Let me invite uh, the first speaker, uh, the former editor of the Journal of Second Language Writing, uh, Icy. Okay, thank you. Let me share screen first. Thank you, Willie. Yeah. Um, okay, good morning. Thanks for uh, attending this webinar. I'm going to talk about publishing in the Journal of Second Language Writing. Okay, here is my presentation outline. I'm going to briefly introduce the journal talk about the review process, as well as the characteristics of papers that are thus rejected, rejected after review and accepted, and finally, some tips for early career researchers. Okay, so who are the JSLW editors? I myself, as a co-editor, sat down end of uh, December last year, and currently we have two co-editors, Dana Ferris and Amanda Kibler, although Dana is also going to step down end of this month. The two associate editors are Todd and Kata. Okay, GSLW is the flagship journal in the field of second language writing with a very high impact factor, 4.2. It's second in language and linguistics and obviously a Q1 journal. So your next question may be, is it very, very hard to get published in JSLW? What do you think? I'll give you an answer here. Here is some information about the 2019 submitted manuscripts and editorial outcomes. Now, um, of the almost 300 manuscripts submitted to JSLW in 2019, about 65% just rejected. 21% rejected after review and about 12% accepted. So not too bad really. So don't be afraid, try JSLW, 2% withdrawn. Now, my advice for authors, especially um, early career researchers is, please, please read the guidelines for authors. And this PDF file is available on the JSLW website. Um, these guidelines don't stay the same forever and the editors do make some tweaks to the guidelines when necessary. So do consult the guidelines before you start writing your manuscripts. Okay. What's the review process like? The assigning editor will assign manuscripts to all the four editors on a random basis. And then the handling editor will do the first screening, outcome being either just reject or sending out paper for review. The journal adopts a double blind review policy and usually two to three reviewers are invited to review a manuscript. And very often one review is from the editorial board. So go to the journal website and find out who the EB members are. We have over 40. Usually a paper receives two rounds of review maximum. And if after the second round of review, 
the paper still requires major substantial revisions, very often the paper is going to be rejected. So roughly speaking, two chances. Papers with minor revision recommendation usually accepted in the end, and the paper will go through copy editing and then finally send to the production team. Okay, this is the average editorial speed for accepted and rejected papers in 2019. That is a turnaround time. Actually, JSLW is doing pretty well, I would say. From submission to first desk rejection is average less than a week. From submission to first decision on average, about 8.5 weeks. From submission to the final editorial outcome is about 15 weeks. Okay, so what are the characteristics of papers that are just rejected? So something you should avoid. Don't be surprised, but we receive papers about task-based language teaching, not related to writing. So it's out of scope and wrong fit. So make sure that you read the guidelines carefully. And some papers are relevant, but they have a narrow focus without a convincing rationale. We do receive papers where authors claim that, oh, no one has researched into this topic, but why? Why is this topic important? We receive papers sometimes about spelling, handwriting, capitalization, but why are these important? So you need a convincing rationale. Some papers have serious problems with writing, really serious, I mean, like some concerns with the overall text structure and sentence level concerns, which make it very, very difficult to understand the paper. Okay, so fundamentally, the primary, uh, the primary criterion is the paper must add substantial new information to our knowledge about how to write it. Without this, the paper may be just rejected. Okay, some papers are rejected after review, unfortunately, and why? Again, these are things you try to avoid. Of course, the topic has to be relevant and interesting to the readers of JSLW, but oftentimes these papers are um, you know, weak in terms of framing, problematic in terms of framing and rationale. Maybe inappropriate framing, and the literature review is either out of scope, inaccurate, unfocused, irrelevant, disorganized. Um, some um, young scholars tend to use a laundry list approach, listing different studies, not in an effective manner without providing a compelling argument for the study. Methodology lacking details, not robust enough, and the findings are piecemeal, not really answering research questions, fragmented and disorganized. And the discussion is a very difficult part for, for authors, especially young authors. Sometimes the findings are presented, but the discussion is superficial, not related to the framing, the framework, and not related to the literature review and not grounded in the findings. There is obvious misalignment between the literature review findings and discussion. And overall, the paper lacks a significant contribution to the field of second language writing without new insight. What about papers that are accepted? The topic is usually very good, relevant, maybe new, meaningful to the field. The literature review is very sound. Um, the studies include are up to date, uh, the review is focused and review leads to a compelling rationale or theoretical motivation of the study. So don't just list all the studies, but at the end, these studies provide a strong persuasive rationale for the study. The methodology shows robustness, research design is appropriate, the details are sufficient to help the readers understand how the study was conducted and the sampling is explained and justified research instruments clearly described, data analysis also clearly explained and appropriately adopted. Um, so overall, there is rigor and there is robustness in data analysis. The findings are clearly presented and they answer the research questions, more importantly. The discussion draws on the conceptual framework and the literature review, and it is grounded in the findings, is closely related to the findings. 
The implications are important for JSRW. There have to be implications. There are important implications for second language writing, maybe writing instruction or other aspects of second language writing. And these implications have to arise from the findings of the study directly. Now, do acknowledge the limitations. Um, each study has its own limitations. And then from there, you recommend further research. Overall, the paper has to provide significant contribution to the field. Okay, some tips for early career researchers or PhD students. I would suggest if you're interested in submitting a paper to the JSRW, consider working with maybe your PhD advisor or a senior colleague. Whether you work on your own or with someone else, do get peer reviewers to review your paper before submission, and this will increase your chance of success. And this is important, do read papers in the target journal. You may have some favorite scholars or favorite articles in the journal. So you may use these favorite articles as your models. Um, find out how the authors organize the paper, frame the, the, the research and present the findings and so on. So use these as your models initially, but no plagiarism, of course. Good news is, JSRW publishes some shorter sections, like we have this short communication section requiring 4,500 words, and the forum section, 25 to 3,500 words, which we are going to, which I'm going to introduce in a second. So short communication, we particularly welcome um, short papers on a smaller aspect of a larger study. So for your PhD study, you can tease out your pilot study or preliminary study and report on that. We also particularly welcome studies conducted in underrepresented contexts of L2 writing. Recently, we also published conference reports. Now, in the past, we only published reports on the symposium on second language writing. But recently, we opened this up to other L2, ESL, or EFL writing conferences in, held in other parts of the world. So if you have organized a conference on second language writing or participated in such a conference, and you're, if you're interested in writing a report on it, you can send a 200 word abstract to the editors for approval. Recently, if you're interested, you can use this as your model. 2019, we published a very nice paper um, called the underrepresented sibling of the symposium on second language writing, um, a report from mainland China. It's basically about the EFL writing conference held in Nanjing in 2018, I think, yeah. Okay, the forum section. It's a very interesting section where authors can respond to a recently published article in the JSLW. So the focus is on a recently published paper. The topic should be controversial, arousing a lot of interest and debatable. And you can write a response within a short time. You can disagree with the author. You can write your response and send it to the editors. And this sort of forum paper is reviewed in-house, not sent out for review. Now, some recent forum pieces. Uh, 2016, an author responded to Ken Highland's paper on linguistic justice as a myth in academic publishing, and we published the forum piece as well as the response of the original author. In other words, we published your response, and we invite the original author to respond to your piece. So two pieces published alongside each other, so it's very interesting. 2018, we've got a response to translinguism published by Givers. And more recently in 2019, we have a response to McKinney and Rose's paper on standards of English in academic writing. So I'd like to end this presentation on a very encouraging note. Don't think that only well-established scholars can get their papers published in JSLW. Recently, we have some papers by early career researchers, and these are all very good topics published um, by um, budding scholars, and these papers are from their PhD studies, like Mimi Lee about uh, wiki, collaborative wiki writing, and she's now a, a, a member of the editorial board of JSLW Givers on translingualism, that forum piece that I mentioned earlier. Um, Nalo with Ken Highland about text mediation, and finally another PhD student on digital multimodal 
composing. So if you're interested, even though you're a green, you are just a PhD student, don't worry, just try. Thank you. I, I see Lee, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, I see. That was okay. very, very good, very informative. And uh, I like the uh, positive note that you ended your presentation with. Uh, it's a journal that is open to everyone. If you're an early career researcher, you can also try your hand at this uh, very, very good journal. Uh, you may probably uh, realize that uh, the Journal of Second Language Writing is what has been called the, a, a theme-focused journal. It only accepts uh, papers related to second language writing. Uh, we will now be moving on to the next two, uh, to the next uh, speaker, who, who is who is the editor of RL, of the RLT journal. Now, this journal is more broad-based. It accepts, you know, different kinds of papers, a wider varieties of papers related to ELT, applied linguistics, and other uh, areas within the broad field of uh, language education. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, Dr. Marie Yeo. Marie? Thank you very much, Dr. Willie. Good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak about the RELC Journal. The RELC Journal is published by Sage Publications in association with CMEO RELC. Our first issue was published in June 1970, exactly 50 years ago, half a century ago. So it's a real pleasure for me today to celebrate the journal's 50th birthday by speaking at this webinar. The first editor of the RELC journal was Professor Jack Richards, and he returned as editor in 2013. Currently, Jack Richards, my colleague Robbie Marlina and I are the editors of the RELC journal. Now, one thing that is special about our journal is that it is mission focused. In other words, the publication of the journal is aimed at supporting RELC's mission. This strongly influences decisions about the aims and scope and what types of articles to publish. It is also why we at the journal are very keen to support early career researchers. Let me tell you very briefly about CMEO RELC. CMEO means Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, and it comprises the ministries of all ASEAN countries plus Timor-Leste. RELC means Regional Language Centre. We are dedicated to the development of language education in the region and the promotion of international cooperation among, inter among language professionals. We do this mainly by offering scholarships to teachers in the ASEAN region through assessment activities and publications. Now that you know about the RELC Journal and RELC, let me move on to my presentation. Dr. Willie has reminded me that I have 15 minutes, so I will address two main points. First, looking at different article types, and second, writing book reviews. When I became editor of the journal in 2012, I noticed we mainly published research articles and book reviews. But I heard complaints from many teachers that research articles in most academic journals are too difficult to understand because they are very technical or because the language is very academic. I also heard from many young researchers that writing a 6,000 word research paper was something too unachievable, something impossible for them. In 2013, RELC decided to launch a variety of article types to give more choices to readers and authors. So currently, we have seven types of articles. 
I'll describe these in detail in the next slides. But as I describe them, please consider which types might be easier for an, for an early career researcher to write and why. So which types might be easier for a young researcher to write and why? All right, the first type is the research article, about 6,000 words. Research articles are usually about empirical research projects and it involves presenting original data. The researcher has to use well-justified methodologies and provide implications that are of interest to a wider audience, not just your own context. Second, we have review articles or thematic reviews. These are about 3,000 words. They are kind of literature review on a particular topic. But please note, it has to be a critical review and not just a summary of different studies. Or as I see Lee earlier said, not just a laundry list of studies. Now next, we have innovations in practice reports. I think these are very suitable for early career researchers. These are like action research reports. They are easier to write as they are shorter, around 3,000 words. Also, there is a fixed format. So, as you can see from the slide, you will need to describe your teaching context, the reason for the innovation. Why did you decide to implement the innovation? Then you need to describe what you did in detail so that other readers can try what you did. This is followed by a reflection and some suggestions for improvement. Now, an important point I'd like to make is it really has to be a real innovation, something specific and something that is really innovative. Recently, we've been receiving many ICT or technology reviews. Now a tech review should describe the functions of the tool, focusing on how it enhances language learning and teaching. One important point is that the review needs to refer to relevant theories and concepts from our field. So you need to cite some references. Now, book reviews are especially popular with early career researchers. We often get book reviews written by masters and PhD students. The word limit is 1000 words. The purpose of book reviews is to make readers aware of new books that are published, maybe to help them to decide whether it's worth reading. I'll be talking more about how to write academic book reviews a little later on. We have a type of article called Conversation with Experts, where we feature a written interview with a renowned scholar. I think this article type is especially useful for you as readers because the experts will explain very difficult concepts, but in a very conversational way. So we have had many experts such as Avril Coxhead, famous for the academic word list. And recently we had an interview with Professor Prabhu, who's considered the father of task-based learning. We've also had the privilege of interview some of my colleagues here today, including I.C. Lee, Christine Go, and of course, Willie Renandia. Finally, we feature viewpoints. These are articles written by prominent scholars or invited scholars in which they express their view on some new developments. Or sometimes they may introduce brand new concepts like the article by Richardson Owen on trans identitying. I don't think you're familiar with this word trans identitying. It's very hard to pronounce. 
But this was the first time the concept and the term had been introduced in a journal. Or we may have authors proposing new ways of thinking about our field. The article, we teach who we are, contemplation, reflective practice and spirituality in TESOL, it's a good example of a viewpoint. In this article, three very famous scholars challenge us to think about our feel in new ways, to think out of the box. Now that you have heard about the different types of articles, let's think about the question I asked earlier. Which types of article would an early career researcher find easier to write? As you can see, the articles that are easier to write are thematic reviews, innovations in practice reports, ICT reviews, and book reviews. So as I promised earlier, I'd like to focus now on book reviews. As I said, we receive many book review submissions from masters and PhD students, probably because they think it's easy to write only a thousand words. You just have to summarize the content, right? Right? Oh. Wrong. In fact, the RELC journal was receiving so many poor quality reviews that I had to have a template for responding to such submissions. It looks like this. Dear author, we are sorry to inform you that your book review has not been accepted for publication. So we usually give some reasons and the reason was this. The review simply described the contents of each chapter, adding a paragraph about the book's merits and shortcomings. Even though your review was grammatically accurate and well organized, it does not meet the requirements of a critical book review for an academic journal. So you may be wondering, why was such a review rejected? What should a book review for an academic journal look like? A book review for an academic journal is much more than just a summary and some of your personal comments. Here are some points to include. Number one, what the book is about. You can comment on the title, the purpose, the audience, the topic. Number two, the expertise of the author. You can write about the author because this is needed to establish the author's credibility. Number three, how well the author covers the topic, including the scope, the accuracy and the clarity of ideas. Number four, how the book compares to other publications on the topic. So you would need to provide some references. Number five, the arrangement of the book. You can comment on the chapters, the sections, the illustrations, whether there are links included, appendices, notes, and so on. And of course, you can comment on other things that you found interesting. Now, one important point is that we generally prefer reviews of books that have been published recently, usually no more than a year old, because readers want to know about new books. To support authors who want to write book reviews, RELC Journal recently commissioned an article from Professor Marilyn Lewis from the University of Auckland. Here's a picture of Professor Lewis. Professor Lewis is a prolific scholar. She has published many books and articles. She's retired now, and one of her hobbies is writing book reviews. In the abstract to her article, Marilyn wrote that, although there are many books about how to write research articles, suggestions to book reviewers on how to write book reviews are harder to find. 
One minute. In fact, sorry. One minute, please. One minute. Oh, gosh. Yeah. The genre of book reviews has received very little attention. So, in Marilyn's article, these are some important points that she states that not one perfect format, that reviewers have their own styles, perspectives, and priorities, different journals may have different expectations, and that you should look at examples of book reviews published in journals you are considering submitting to. So I'd just like to end by saying that um, the RELC journal has updated our website and as part of our 50th birthday celebrations, um, we have now um, uploaded examples of article types for you to download free of charge. So you can go to the website, you can look at the article type that you want to publish and you can download the article. Please pay attention to the word limit, purpose, structure, style, and quality. So I'd like to end by skipping one slide and going to my final slide. This is some advice from an author. And he says that one thing that he learned about publishing is that you should start um, to write by starting small, small and writing short articles experiencing the review process and getting the sense of success when articles are published. So in closing, I'd like to wish you the sense of success as a teacher and a researcher. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, ladies you. and gentlemen, big hands please for Mario. Uh, I, th I think after the presentation, uh, Marie, you can expect yes. lots of submissions from the audience. <laughs> you made you made the whole you know uh, business of publishing uh, sound so easy uh, to do, especially for uh, early career researchers. Thank you very much for thank that. Thank you, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, next editor is Professor Larry Zhang, uh, co-editor of System, another Q1 journal. It's not easy to get in, but I think he will you know offer some tips. Uh, for us to consider uh, when we write our paper for system. System is a little bit like the RLC journal. It's a, it's a broad based uh, general type of journals that publish uh, a wide range of topics related to applied linguistics, TESOL and language education. Uh, Larry, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Willie, and uh, Supan for the invitation. Uh, I feel quite happy to share my experience as one of the editors of, of the journal system. As um, Professor I.C. Lee and Dr. Marie Yeo has, have already shared with you, uh, a lot of good advice and also suggestions for preparing different kinds of articles. I'm going to focus on some things that you haven't uh, talked about. First of all, I haven't got uh, photographs of those editors because we've got a large editorial team. Different from many other journals, System probably has the largest editor number of editors on board, mainly because we have probably, again, in our field, the largest numbers of submissions uh, from different regions around the world. So if you see the list of journal editors, we've got Andy Gao from uh, Australia, Marta from America, Marian, who is now moved to Australia, who used to be in Hong Kong at University of Hong Kong, and Jim McKinley at, at the University of London, uh, UCL. I'm based in, in Auckland in New Zealand. Larry, and can you, can you enlarge from, the screen, please? Enlarge the screen. Uh, I thought I'd yeah. done it. No, okay, you haven't. Sorry. Yes, good, excellent. Okay, so different from the two journals that you've just seen, uh, you will see that system has a particular uh, section that is called book review. And the book review has a particular editor who is responsible for book reviews only. So the five editors, Andy, me, Marta, Marian, and Jim, do not handle book reviews. So book reviews are submitted through the system, but are handled by the only person, Dr. Vincent Grinier, who was my PhD graduate uh, two years ago. 
Now, I would like to uh, share a bit about some of the ideas that uh, I see and Marie talked about, because remember some journals have particular scopes that are clearly stated on the website. If your paper does not fall into the categories that this journal is interested in, then you should really think carefully, read the guidelines, particularly the aims and scopes of the journal before you prepare the, the manuscript for submission to this particular journal. Otherwise, when you submit it within a day or two, the paper is rejected straight away. This is called the desk, desktop rejection as IC has shared. Now, if you read the first sentence, it says clearly, REOC journals, REOC journal and, and the journal of second writing, for example, these journals have their own different missions, but the system has a mission that clearly says it publishes cutting edge research on the application of educational technology and applied linguistics to solving problems of foreign language teaching and learning. Now, this includes any foreign language, not only just English, Chinese as a foreign language, French as a foreign language, Russian as a foreign language, or Japanese as a foreign language, or Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia as a foreign language, whichever language that is regarded as a foreign language in a particular context, as long as you describe it clearly that this is a foreign language, then that is the paper that fits the journal. But what is different is that we do not have so many varieties of journal articles in this particular journal. We have only three types of manuscripts that are welcome. The first category is called full length research articles. This is really a research section. Most of the papers that are and have been published in system are research articles. In other words, system is a research focused journal which is probably different from uh, REOC journal that is targeting early career researchers at the same time classroom teachers who want to read research and also classroom tips. But system unfortunately does not publish research, uh, does not publish teaching tips or teaching related articles about how to teach, for example. We don't publish this kind of article. So please bear in mind when you think of submitting a paper to system, you have to be clear about the scope of the journal. The second category of articles would be synthesis or meta-analytic reviews of a particular topic. For example, in recent, um, one of the recent articles, uh, Dr. Xiaofeng Li from Florida State University has published an article which is about 15 pages long, that's more than 12,000 words, which is a synthesis of feedback research in the field of second language learning, including oral feedback as well as written feedback, which was what I talked about yesterday. We do have book review uh, section. The book review section, as I said, is handled by Dr. Vincent Grinier, and he is based in Scotland, and he is the only person that deals with book reviews. If you are interested in writing a book review, following Dr. Marie Yeo's advice in how to write a book review, as well as my former colleague, Marilyn Lewis, is a good advice on how to prepare a book review. If you really want to write a book review, please first write an email to the editor, the book review editor, to see whether the book has already been reviewed. If you write a book review and it turns out the review has already been published on that particular book, then you will be feeling that you are wasting your time. So you have to, first of all, signal to the editor seek his advice and see whether he is interested in having your book review published because it is highly possible that the book has already been reviewed by another uh, teacher or another writer that has been published in the same journal system. So system does not want to publish a second review of the same book. So the system requires articles to have a sound theoretical base and a visible practical application for a broad readership. But remember, this is really research-based article that has shown practical application for a broad readership. Attention is also paid to the learning and teaching of all languages. As I said, it's not only English alone. Some authors have misunderstood the scope of the journal, assuming that a system only focuses on issues in relation to English language teaching and research. Review articles, that's what I call second, second category of articles, 
are considered for publication if they deal with critical issues in language learning and teaching with the significant implications for practice and research. Now, I would like to see, to show how our manuscript flow uh, goes. As I see showed uh, to you a few moments ago, uh, Elsevier publishes a large number of language and linguistic journals. So system is published by Elsevier, as you can see from my slide at the far left bottom side, the Elsevier company logo that shows El Elsevier as the publisher. Now, this is a list of official uh, data from the publisher. We have increasingly seen large numbers of submissions from year on. From 2016, you can see we had only 696 submissions. But if you look at 2019, we had 854 submissions. That's a large number, by the way, which is the reason why I said that the rejection rate is probably quite high. Now, the, the figures are quite self-explanatory. I do not want to explain a lot about the numbers, but this year, in March, when lockdown happened in Europe and in New Zealand, Australia, and also in China, for example, around the world, the number of submissions shot up quite substantially. In March alone, we received 120 submissions. That made the editors very busy, by the way. So if you look at the standard rejection rate and desk rejection rate, you will see how the success rate of submissions will be looking like if you want to have a try. Uh, the standard rejection rate is about 14% so far. And for 2019, that's 17%, but desk rate rejection is 66%. Remember that we have five editors. So the rejection rate would differ from different, or different editors. Some editors might have higher rejection rate than the other editors. So in my case, I did a calculation the other day. My rejection rate was 93.3%. Uh, now the su submission acceptance as well as rejection of all content by publication item type, you will see that book reviews have relatively highest, highest percentage of acceptance rate, but full length articles, the, the acceptance rate is going down. Review articles is relatively uh, similar to the full length research articles. This is because review articles, some of which are commissioned but we don't have short communication, but it could be the miscalculation from the publisher of other categories that brought into the short communication. We have, as I said, three categories of articles, full length articles, systematic reviews, as well as book reviews. Now we have different from other journals, probably, uh, we have special issue uh, possibilities for scholars who have experiences in publishing if a earlier, an earlier career researcher who has good ideas and is interested in having a special issue, you can team up with experienced authors to submit a proposal for a special issue so that the editorial team can consider the possibilities of you being the guest editors of a special issue. The articles that we have received in terms of the territories or regions or countries that it come from are well distributed. I have to be, I have to say that we have a good representation of geographical locations. Although sometimes if you look at the year, North and Central America take a big proportion sometimes or most of the times Asia is the biggest proportion of authors whose articles that we receive for possible consideration. And Asia from 2016, if you look at this blue column is Asia, it's always consistently high. The reason is very simple because Asia has the largest numbers of foreign language teachers and the population density is also very high. That's the reason why. And Europe is also well represented, but New Zealand is relatively um, less represented or underrepresented because of its smaller population that New Zealand has. But how about the articles that have been finally accepted with reference to the country, region or territory? 
and it is proportionate to the number of submissions that come from Asia or North or Central America or Oceania or South America or some other territories that have not been indicated from the data we have. But in the end, the number of submissions, if you look at 2019, 67 articles are accepted from Asia. And this is from Europe, 23, and North and Central America, 25. And this one is Oceania, that is Australia, mainly Australia and New Zealand, only 11 articles. So that's the proportion of submitted articles that have been finally accepted. Most of the young or junior or earlier career researchers or authors are interested in uh, the criteria that editors use in, make in making decisions. The typical peer review process, I have to say, if you are really unclear, when your paper is submitted, the journal editors, and we also have an editorial assistant or ed assistant editor who goes through and see whether the paper is a full length article, is, is it more than 4,000 words, for example. If it's too brief, three pages, four pages, that already disqualifies the paper as going to the next stage. So that is directly rejected by one of the editors. So if the paper is screened and is regarded as suitable, then it will be to move to the stage of either being rejected after screen, screening or it will be sent out for review. Now the review is typically done by two independent reviewers. This is a double blind process. And someone, I think, I see mentioned a double blind review. That means the editor, I'm sorry, the, the author does not know who the reviewers are. Neither do the reviewers know who the author is. So it, you can only see the manuscript and you don't know who the manuscript writer is. So that's a double review process. So if you look at our journal system, I think the key considerations that we have to take into include the following. Is the paper relevant or good fit to the, to, to the journal? Is the topic current or interesting? I mean, interesting in the sense that it's academically relevant. Is lit review current and well-developed as I see shared with you and also Marie shared with you? Are there references from the other important journals? Or are you only referring to your own work? Is the paper well-written in terms of language, structure, and flow? You mean the idea flow? So if, you, if everything is quite okay, then the selection will be based on topic knowledge, availability, lack of conflict. If those kind of things are considered by the editors as valid, then the review will really go forward. But many authors, including myself, are quite curious about the duration of the review. Most often, many young scholars do not know that the international journals like System never charge any fees from, edit from authors. So the reviewers also do the review as a voluntary professional service. Harry, so one minute. Invite, okay, we, we, we it, invite, yeah. okay, we invite reviewers, but reviewers may not necessarily be willing to accept the, the invitation to review. So it depends on the, the length, but in general, many reviewers are professional. They return their reviews quite in time. Most often three months is regular is the regular pattern of turnout rate. I just show you in 2019, the final from submission to the final publication is about 23 weeks. Okay, the average publication speed for published articles, if you look at it, it's about 39 weeks because we've got large numbers of, of submissions every year. It's about 900 submissions last year. So we had quite high impact factor, but it's not as high as Journal of Second Writing. As I see said, Journal of Second Writing is now number one in the field of broadly defined as applied linguistics, but it's a very specialized journal. But I have listed four journal, three journals, including uh, the applied linguistics, uh, language learning and the modern language journal, but if system included four are put here, our impact factor is increasing. In 2019, the impact factor that is retrievable from the system is now 2.96. 
The other journal's impact factor information is unretrievable because we do not handle the information that's secret and confidential to the publishers that handle these journals. And I have one last slide for uh, the audience to see. If you look at the most cited articles in 2019, you will definitely know what are the ranges and the topics that authors and readers are interested in. With that note, I finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. That was very comprehensive and uh, very informative and very useful as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you recall, uh, System is a research-focused journal, and so is the uh, Journal of Second Language Writing. Uh, these two are research-focused journals. Uh, the RFT journal, on the other hand, is you know one that accepts both research papers and also the more pedagogically uh, oriented papers. Uh, as to whether uh, one is more difficult to get in or one is more easy to get in, I think you need to ask the editors later uh, yeah. at some point. Yeah. Uh, I would like now to make use of the time uh, while the other two speakers are getting ready for, for Professor Supong and I to ask some questions to the uh, uh, excellent editors who just presented their excellent presentations. Ajahn Supong, do you have any questions to ask? Uh, yeah, first of yeah. all, I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers, okay, for their uh, useful and insightful information this morning. Uh, let me start, you know, with the first question. Uh, so Professor Isley mentioned that, you know, uh, a paper that would be considered, okay, for publication, you know, should have a good topic, okay, uh, with, you know, relevant, novel, meaningful information to the field. Okay, so uh, could, could you uh, give some examples or explain more about this? And actually this question is also for uh, all of you, all the speakers. Okay, if I can share my, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. If I can share my screen again, actually um, the last slide, remember the last slide? Mm -hmm. um, let me go to the last slide. I've got some really good topics here. Now, I understand that a lot of early career researchers are very confused about what a novel topic is. And I remember in one symposium on second language writing when they brought up this point, there's a very established scholar who was trying to argue with us. I don't think there's anything new under the sun. What do you mean by novel, blah, blah, blah. So it's really hard <laughs> to you know, argue on this. But you know, as an experienced writer, sometimes, sometimes you pick up a paper, you read it, oh, what's new about it? Now, so I have shown you these topics. I think these are pretty good and new topics like text mediation, digital multimodal composing, Translinguism, translanguage, right? Collaborative wiki writing, right? Now, maybe let me share an example with you about feedback. I know that a lot of scholars are interested in feedback, especially written corrective feedback. So a lot of papers have been written about uh, written corrective feedback. And I would say, if you still want to um, replicate previous studies about whether written corrective feedback on articles, or on a very small language item is going to help students improve the written accuracy of that particular item. I think there's not much new in this line of research unless you can make a strong argument. You can really make use of the prior research literature to help you build your case, to provide a very persuasive rationale for this line of research. So to tell you honestly, if we receive papers along this line, for example, written corrective feedback, um, um, experimental or post-experimental design, focusing on a single um, linguistic item, if not article, another item, why? Because research has already shown very clear that, clearly that it's now time to move beyond this line of research to focus more on the real classroom with stronger pedagogical relevance. So I would say, if you still choose to work on that line of research, choosing a particular linguistic structure to work on for your WCF research, I would say it's not very new and it may not be particularly meaningful for JSLW. Mm -hmm. now, have I made myself clear, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Icy. Could I, uh, okay. uh, could I add uh, yeah, sure. to yes, what Icy said? Uh, I, mean, I think Icy has highlighted a very significant point. 
But on the other hand, for uh, junior researchers or early career researchers, if you feel that JSLW is not interested in this particular topic, mm. other journals will be. Because yeah. mm. other teachers, I mean, written career feedback, for example, is of a particular relevance to writing teachers and learning in the classroom by any foreign language uh, teacher in the, in the foreign language context. I mean, correct feedback is always what teachers do. If you really are very keen to do this kind of research, other journals might be interested, but JSLW is no longer interested. Mm. Uh, I know it's not re interested because my paper was rejected as well. <laughs> <laughs> my papers were rejected before. Yeah, same. So I, I've been, in the end, my paper is published in another journal. Mm. Mm. Okay, next yeah, question. Okay. Now, now here, here is a big question for everyone. Uh, I think also in the back of, uh, you know, many of the people in the audience also have the same uh, questions. Your rejection is just too high, 90 plus percent. Mm. And maybe some of the reasons is that space is limited, number one. Number two, you know, maybe because you accept long papers for the, uh, for the uh, featured articles, you can only accept, you know, so many in one issue. Mm. So what if you increase the uh, number of issues per year, for example, number one. And number two, cost should not be a problem nowadays because everything is online. Whether you publish yeah. 10 or you publish 20 or 30, it should be possible now because cost is no longer an issue. Uh, mm. is, that, is that something that is doable, something that is possible so that we, have, we can give a lot more opportunities for promising you know, emerging scholars to publish mm. in, in your journals? Uh, your take on this, please. Is this the question to I see or to me? Both of you. Or Marie. Also to Marie. Yeah. Oh, Marie. Well, I, I, can, I can comment on this because yeah. Sage mm. Publications has been trying to get us to increase uh, the number of issues. Uh, but actually, years, um, yeah. th there are actually a lot of associated costs that um, perhaps readers don't see because with um, journals published by Sage or Elsevier and other big uh, companies, there's actually a lot of post-production that happens. Mm. So when an article is published, it actually has to go to Sage Productions in India. And mm. there's a whole team of people who do the copy editing, the typesetting, mm. and then it actually comes back to RELC. And each article is further proofread by a lecturer because um, at the RELC journal, we welcome articles from um, maybe people, you know, maybe your English is not extremely good. So there may be some things that we need to correct um, afterwards. Yeah. So I think mm. with purely online journals, uh, Willie, I quite agree that mm. they can publish um, as many articles as they want mm. to. But yeah. with journals that still publish in print-based, it's a bit right. difficult for us to just increase the number of pages. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could I could I add sure. a bit? Yes, I, I, mean, I think I totally agree with Marie's comment about journals that still go for print publications. Mm. That cost is extremely high labor cost and other cost that the authors and readers do not know. But for Elsevier, I forgot to mention that Elsevier has moved to article-based publication mode, which means if your article has gone through the review, two rounds, maybe three rounds in the end, a maximum, if your paper survived the review, and if it's accepted, it's immediately moving on to the production. So once it's produced in PDF, proofread is done, it's made available, it's already published because it's article-based publication. It's no longer talking about continuous pagination. So your article stand alone as from page one to page 12, for example. So in the, in the way, Elsevier is very innovative. Uh, it is increasing the number of publications per year. But as Marie also correctly pointed out, the labor cost is too expensive. We have already increased from num from four issues per year to eight issues per year. So mm. this, this is already a substantial increase in terms of number of papers that we can publish. Mm. But that's the reason why the publisher have hired five editors. Even mm. so, mm. we feel overstretched by the number of submissions and reviewers are also overworked because of the numbers of submissions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. For JSLW, we are more than happy to publish as many papers as we can. I think a few years back, there was a perception that 
the rejection rate was way too high. There was a perception that it's so hard to publish in JSLW. Mm. Each issue, you only had like three papers. Yes. But I think yes. recently you could see an increase, so which is good news. We are really, really encouraging early mm. career researchers okay. to publish in the journal. And as mm. I've shown you, there are success cases. So don't feel discouraged. Don't think that JSLW is not for um, <clears throat> early career scholars. It is, mm. I think. Also for them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, How about really? I, yes. Really, I forgot to respond to the uh, question that you got from the audience about uh, why the rejection rate is so so high. Mm. I once talked to the publisher. I thought I was too mean. Mm. I said, you know, my re rejection rate was ninety point ninety three mm. almost. Oh, you are not. Said, You're How? not mean. <laughs> yeah. I I said I'm not mean. <laughs> then I looked at my record. I realized that those papers. I think out of 97% of the papers, probably about 80% of papers were what I requested to be transferred to mm. sister journals of the publisher Elsevier. Okay. These journals, but of course the authors didn't take up the offer because mm. these journals used to be charging publication fees. Okay. One is Ampersand, the journal that is called Ampersand. Mm. And the other one is uh, arts and humanities and social sciences, that journal. But from next month, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the publisher has decided to not charge any fees for the other two journals as well. So if I transfer your paper mm. to one of these two journals, that means you can be considered for the possibility of being published. Mm. Although they are going to go through the review process because I reject the paper without going through the review. It's a desk desk rejection that has been transferred to the new okay. to yeah. new journal. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Uh, one, one, one more question before we move on to the next segment of uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, now, this has to do with citation. I know mm. citation is very important. Yeah. Mm. Now, if, if you look at the statistics, uh, papers published in humanities, language education is one of the uh, you know, areas within humanities. The number of citations of papers in humanities is very small compared to, uh, you know, uh, papers published in other areas of research like science, you know, psychology and, 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 and things like that. And one of the reasons people have been saying is that our papers are just too long and nobody mm. is reading our papers. Mm. 8,000 words is just too long. Mm. Can we make it shorter? Like 4,000 words, for example, you know, uh, the, the way I see it or the way people see it is that the uh, introductory part, the uh, lit review section is just way too long. It's, it's a dissertation style of writing that we are still expecting people to do when they publish their papers. So can we make it more concise? Can we make it shorter? Can we just assume that if you write something about feedback, for example, then you should know about feedback. Uh, you should know, you know enough about the literature of feedback. So, so what's your take on that? How about persuading your publishers to, or, or to your editorial friends to consider shorter, more concise uh, you know, type of empirical papers? Your take on that before we move on to the next uh, speakers. I have to applaud REOC Journal for having successfully done so. I feel guilty about not doing enough for this, uh, but system might have challenges. Um, because of its tradition being a journal that focuses on research. Mm. Uh, but maybe another good idea is what REOC Journal is doing, which is a brief, uh, JSLW as well as REOC Journal are doing, is the brief research report. Yeah. Uh, Tissot Courtley, I used to be the co-editor of uh, Tissot Courtley's brief research reports, and that section welcomes uh, articles of about 4,000 words as a maximum length. Mm. And the uh, system hasn't got that section yet. Maybe right. another way is to uh, model the practice that JSLW yeah. is doing mm. for system. I'll raise this point with my team and see how we are going to respond to the suggestion. Yeah. The word limit for our full length articles is 10,000 words actually, oh, yeah. but we do have this right. short communication section, which yes. is becoming yes. more and more popular. Mm. I noticed that in the past, we've published very few papers yes. in that mm. short communication section. But uh, once we started sort of promoting this section, I mean, authors simply were not aware of this section. Mm. So 
I think this section is becoming more popular. I myself have recently, yep. you know, submitted a paper to this section. So yeah, I like writing shorter papers these days. It's yes, a good me idea, too. really. Me too, yeah. actually. 2,000 yeah. words. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, Dr. Supong, can we now move on? Yeah, yeah, we can move on. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, oh, thank you again, uh, editors. Uh, we'll get back to you later during the Q&A session, uh, you know, to, to, to entertain questions from the audience. Uh, but for now, let me uh, invite the next two speakers. The first one is my colleague from NIE, uh, Professor Kristin Goh. She is, very, uh, she is very well published and she has had a lot of experience uh, publishing in very, very good journals in, uh, in our field. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor uh, Christine Go. Christine. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I really enjoyed listening to the editors. You've heard the expert advice. So what I'm going to do is to provide a personal perspective on publishing. And uh, these will be some of the areas that I will be touching on. My experience, overall experience, um, strategies, what were the sort of strategies I had developed in order to ensure that you know, my, my paper will stand a better chance. Um, how do I respond to reviewers' comments? And of course, how did I deal with rejections? And finally, I hope to end with a couple of um, uh, tips for especially colleagues who are just embarking on your uh, academic career, and hopefully it'll be useful. So let me start by talking about my overall experience. I published uh, for more than 25 years now, um, starting with an article um, that came out of my master's uh, research. Two words, enriching, humbling. It's been very enriching because I have learned so much along the way. Um, you know, when I look back at the more than 25 years, I think I have become a much better writer, a much better thinker. And it's largely because of the process. Um, grueling though it may be, um, but it had helped me professionally. And the interaction with um, ideas from reviewers, for example, have been very, very, very useful for me and also developing my skills of engaging. Um, humbling. We all know that, you know, the review process can be very instructive, but sometimes it can also be very harsh. I mean, uh, Larry just said, you know, has he been very mean by rejecting more than 90% uh, papers? Um, I think I had been lucky in a sense um, that I have had some pretty good reviewers who gave very good um, comments but overall, um, the, the, the whole experience is humbling because we all like to think that we're doing good work. We all like to think that our research, our thinking and everything is, uh, you know, is good. And I, I, I still believe that you know, the work that we do uh, must measure up to something. But when um, you go through the review process and you get comments from editors, um, reviewers, and sometimes it, really gives you a reality check. And I think it is very helpful because at the end of the day, uh, it is this kind of reality checks, this kind of very helpful collegial feedback that helps us think about our work better. Of course, nobody wants to be told that there are gaps in the, the writing. And of course, gaps would mean gaps in thinking as well, right? So, but overall, I think um, if I reflect on this experience, I think it's been a great one good learning experience, humbling, very good for my own professional development and my personal development. Okay, so what are the strategies? Um, actually, you've heard all the three experts tell you about the strategies, but I'll give you my personal take very, very quickly uh, and experience. Know the journal. You need to know which journal you're submitting to. For me, my first article I mentioned earlier was based on my master's um, dissertation. And I wrote it up and I submitted to the first journal that I knew of. And it was uh, a familiar journal to me because I read a lot of articles from that journal during my master's. I, the paper was sent out for review. It came back, the editor said, um, actually they had good reviews. Um, generally they felt that the piece of work was well conducted, but it was a rejection. Why? 
because the editor said that we think the readers of this journal will not have the background knowledge to understand some of the data that you have included and, and the, the theoretical framework that you have introduced, which was uh, pretty new at that time. Um, but eventually I submitted it to another journal and, and that got accepted. But based on that, that experience, I began to learn to study past articles. I look at past articles in those journals that I'm interested in, um, especially the recent past, because some you know, journals, the scope, um, the emphasis may shift over the years. So by looking at articles that have been published in the, in the recent past, um, not just in my, on my topic, but on all the other uh, related topics, I actually learned quite a lot about uh, the positioning of the articles, about what the, 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 the trends have been. And I, I felt that that was very helpful for me when considering which journal to, to publish in. It must offer new knowledge. Um, you, you just heard IC talk about you know, feedback. But I think the other, the other thing is also true that a, a field that has been researched very you know, extensively does not mean that um, it, it cannot benefit from new information, new knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how your, your data is used and how it is angled and positioned in a way that will offer a fresh set of uh, insights to your readers. And finally, something that I always try to remember, and I didn't think of this when I started my publishing, is that every piece of writing is an argument, is a persuasion. I have to use my data to argue, my discussion to argue. I have to persuade my readers also of the value of my argument. So these are some of the things that I bear in mind um, when I write for journals. How do I respond to reviewers' comments? Appreciate, study, evaluate, revise. Actually, it wasn't until I was asked to review a journal article that I began to appreciate how much work goes into the reviewing of an article. I think as a writer, sometimes we get the comments from the reviewers and we have all sorts of reactions. But if you think about it, you know, for a good um, piece of review, the person actually has to spend a lot of time. And I've been fortunate as well in getting very good feedback on my writing. I would say that more than 95% of the feedback from the reviewers' comments have been useful. And I was convinced that these reviewers actually spent time reading my article and also giving me very good feedback. Study. I literally study the comments. I use pencil, highlighter. I write down notes on the margin to help me see where the areas are that needed uh, improvement. Um, if it is a paper that needed to be resubmitted or revised, um, those will help. But what if a paper is rejected? It's yeah. still very useful because I will take note of all those things and rewrite it for another journal. Um, apart from studying, I think we also need to evaluate the comments. Um, sometimes a, a reviewer may come to my experience, in my experience at least, I find that a reviewer may come from a particular angle and may not see what I was trying to put forward so sometimes I would, instead of uh, responding to everything and making all the changes that were asked for, I would try to make a case for why certain aspects of that paper may be good for, you know, to be retained. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm taking a risk there, but uh, I think as writers, we must also be very active thinkers in evaluating the kind of feedback that we get. But overall, the feedback has been uh, helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And of course, revise. If you want to publish, you have to revise the article. Um, sometimes people say, oh, you know, the comments are so bad, I'm never ever going to write again. Or I'm not going to touch this topic again. Um, that would be a real mistake because there is always something good in the manuscript that you submitted. You just need to benefit from the wisdom of other people. Okay, um, rejections. How do you deal with rejections? Nobody likes rejections. Um, but I was quite heartened to hear from all the three editors that they've all had rejections before. So um, let me just show you a couple of things from what I got. I'm sorry that your article was not recommended for publication and I hope that you're not too disappointed. <sighs> I think everyone will be disappointed when your article is not recommended for um, publication, but, I, uh, but the, the, the editor here is also trying to be very encouraging because the overall tone of the, the the letter, not an email. Then this was a very early time, you know, days when 
um, editors still send you in uh, decisions in letter form. The letter was really very well written uh, in a very encouraging tone. Okay, uh, author reviewer one recommends acceptance with minor revisions, reviewer two raises a number of problems. So when it comes to something like that, uh, editors have to make a decision. And editors, from my experience, will always make a decision in the interest of the journal and to ensure that the article that will be eventually published will meet a certain level of expectations and acceptance by the community. So if because of this that, you know, a paper is rejected or asked to be rev revised and resubmitted, it is because of that. It is because as a field, we really need to uphold the highest standards possible. So there are also words that, are re that re reviewers use, um, inadequate, lacking, or as in case of one reviewer commented on something in my writing that was woefully lacking and something that was faulty. So these things are, these words are very harsh. Um, what do you do with them? I think from the, the, the years of, you know, learning to publish and learning from others, I have come to um, these three things. Accept the decision, because many of these decisions are very well considered. We may not agree with everything, but at the end of the day, we accept the decision and accept it graciously. Mm -hmm. I have been a guest editor for three special issues, and I've also for a period of time been the co-editor for two education uh, journals. And sometimes I do get comments coming back to, to, to me it, it, when I was wearing my editor's hat um, that were rather unprofessional. So, you know, sometimes I would feel that, okay, I can understand this person was angry, but I think overall, as we develop as academic, we need to find ways of coping with these things and always respond calmly. For me, in the early days when I receive a letter from the editors, I will tear open it and read it. And then I will read the decision and, and sometimes I'm, I'll be elated. Sometimes I'll be very, very disappointed. Mm -hmm. But I have also learned ways of coping um, and making sure that if it is not a favorable reply, I will have a cooling off period before I read and study the comments. Look for the silver lining because every report has a silver lining. Good reviewers will not just tear down your articles. A good reviewer will give you a balanced uh, uh, evaluation. So look for the strengths that the, the reviewers have highlighted. Underline those, highlight those, mm. and build on those. Mm. And, and then use the other comments to rework the article and move on. If the, the journal says, okay, you know, basically don't come back, um, then find somewhere else because Personally, and from my own experience as well, there is always a home for the articles that we write. It may not be the one that we wanted, but um, if we change and benefit from the, the reviewer's feedback, we can always submit it elsewhere. And there is a chance that that article can be accepted in another uh, journal. Yeah. So finally, okay, and this is just a, a summary, uh, accept, learn and move on. But I want to just end with a couple of um, tips I think as review, uh, as writers, as um, academics, especially if you are a young um, and up and coming academic or doing a PhD, you have to find your voice and find your niche because your publication, your research will depend very much on this voice that you have and the niche that you have found for yourself. I know that for young um, academics, there is this pressure of building up the volume. You've got to have how many articles published in a year and so on. Uh, that is of course a part of the requirement, but in order to emerge and develop as a good academic, you need to find your area and you need to be an advocate for your area and you need to use all possible means through your research, through your presentations to advocate for that area. That's your voice and that's your niche. And when you present your um, dossier for your promotion or for your contract renewal, you'll find that you have a very coherent body of work. Mm. Recognize your own contribution. I think it is very important for us to value our own work. Very often when we submit an article to a journal, we feel that we are at the end of uh, you know, receiving all the uh, decisions. 
But actually, our very act of submitting an article is a contribution on our part. We need to contribute to knowledge in our field. And the way we do it is to write and submit our articles and let it go through the process. But always recognize that what you're doing is making a contribution. And if in the end your paper is published, it will also contribute to the journal because the, the citations for your article and all those things are gonna to contribute to the impact factor and other impact matrix of the journal. Okay, there's um, nothing else I could add, but to say to this point is that the only way to get published is to write. Uh, identify suitable outlets. This include depending on, you know, varying the journals, but also in some cases, it may not be a journal. If an opportunity arises for you to uh, submit something for a, a call for a special uh, edition, uh, uh, edited volume, go for it. Instead of um, you know, waiting uh, for another good opportunity, um, that may be the opportunity that they, you need. It may not be in a journal, but it is uh, an edited volume in a, with a good publisher. Hone your craft, takes years, takes time. We're all still developing our craft, um, but it is well worth doing this. Mm -hmm. Challenge yourself. Um, okay, if you get rejected, don't get, you know, uh, don't, don't be too discouraged, rise up, and reach for something that is even higher in time to come. Collaboration is the way to go, co-authorship and so on. Um, and also depending on the areas that you work on. And finally, stay resilient. I think as writers, we need to be resilient because there will be the rejections, there will be disappointments, but we have to bounce back and write because we have to recognize our contribution. So I'll end with this thought. Very often in academia, we are told publish or perish. But I want to encourage everyone that we can publish and flourish. Keep that in mind instead of thinking about what the, the, the negative part. Let us publish and flourish. And I wish all of you the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. That was very, very positive. Uh, I like the last bit, uh, publish and flourish. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just one point for us to remember, rejection is an important part of the game, but rejection at the same time is not the end of the game. I think rejection is just one way for us to, to work harder, to try harder, and to consider other uh, you know, avenues of publication. Uh, moving on now, the last but not least presenter is an emerging scholar, uh, Assistant Professor Prichaya, Mongkulhuti. Prichaya. She recently completed her PhD from the UK and uh, she is now a faculty member at the uh, Language Institute of Tamasat University. Prichaya. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you turn um, on your video? Yeah, I'm yes. trying starting my okay. video soon. Okay. Um, bear with me. Yes, you are uh, Prichaya, you right? Nothing yes, to do I with, am. Nothing to do with uh, Chow Praya or anything, right? No, as, no, no. As, I'm Prichaya. <laughs> Prichaya. Okay. Yeah, can you see me? Uh, not yet. Try again. Um, uh, it shows that the host has asked you to start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Hi, good morning from Bangkok. Um, well, I think like all the expert editor and of course, um, um, uh, the, uh, Professor Christine Cover, like most of uh, essential of what to know as an early career researcher, okay? And as all of you already learned about what to do to increase your chance of getting accepted from the experts, it's my turn to share with you my personal experience regarding manuscript submission. And let me share my uh, PowerPoint here. Okay. Um, actually, uh, 
Regarding the manuscript submissions, of course, what I want to share with you, it's more about how I deal with the pain from rejections as an early career researcher. Uh, let me first tell you briefly about my journal, journey on the road to publication. Um, well, 2016, recently, is when I finished my PhD and it was my first time attempting paper submission, which means just four years ago. And so far, four years after graduation, I had four papers submitted. Three of them has already been published in Scopus Index Journal. And the fourth one is still under a revision, of course, after a rejection. In my case, um, getting the first two papers published took two years, the whole process, like through um, rejection after rejections. Mm. And the third one was accepted within six months on its first attempt. See, such a huge different uh, experience. And that was my huge learning curve. And so what I want to share with you today is mainly what I have done to go through on uh, this journey of emotional roller coaster as a very like newbie in the field. Um, uh, I don't know what's wrong with my PowerPoint. Uh, I I'll try to move my PowerPoint. Let, let me try again. Okay. Um, as you can see here, for early career researcher like us, publishing in a prestige journal is a golden ticket to many opportunities, right? Like graduation requirement or job application, contract renewal or promotion, right? Mm. These are the main reasons for our first publication, right? But actually in my case, um, for the first two paper submission was not just because of these reasons. I was doing uh, paper submission for the sake of experience gaining. Um, at that time, my job has already secured. This sounds um, pretty uh, amazing, right? However, my road to publication was not as smooth as it should. My very first submission was Dex rejected. And a couple of submissions after that led to no better results. Uh, even I don't have to worry about uh, securing my job or hoping for a promotion from the submission. Getting one rejection after another massively discouraged me from the whole process. And my stress level at that time was to the roof. So for those of you who still have time, or not having high stake to lose, I strongly encourage you to get into the game, to get into the process as soon as possible so that you can test the water. And well, for the first paper, with my lack of experience and the fact that I had to go through the whole experience alone, I could say that it was such a painful experience. Well, I have just learned for not a long while ago that what I have done tick most of the boxes of don't for publication. However, what makes this pain a bit more bearable is my second submission. And this is not because it was a success. Actually, my second paper was rejected before being well received from the journal. Um, actually, what made the pain from the weight and the failures of the first submission bearable is the fact that I had something else to look forward to apart from the first paper. I could say that focusing on writing and developing my second paper successfully shift my focus from the pain of getting rejected. Accordingly, a takeaway from me to our early career researcher is that if you're not lucky enough to avoid the pain from the waiting and from the rejection, please always have a side project, start another research or write another paper 
of course, taking criticism you have received from the first paper with you. I know this might be easily said than done. Well, honestly, it took me months uh, until I eventually mentally ready to reopen my email and go through the reviewer's comments. So allow yourself some time. Um, another takeaway from me on what make my pain on paper submission more bearable is how I view rejection. If you ever had your paper published or try once, you will eventually learn that rejections always come first as uh, every editor or every uh, experienced researcher experience. Rejections always come first and rejection will eventually your friends. After spending some time on um, mourning my, on my failures, at the end of the day, I learned that uh, rejection is a friend. I mean one, but actually this friend is pretty honest. Mm -hmm. So listen to um, your friend. Your friend might tell you these things. Your friend might tell you to um, recalibrate your objective, refine your writing, reassess your approach, or even reconsider your destination. I eventually ending up uh, changing my destination, which means uh, resubmitting uh, the revised paper to a different journal several times. And this is because of these mean friend that I have listened to. So listen to your friend. And well, at the end of the day, you can decide what to do on your paper after listening to uh, the reviewer's comments. Like you can appeal on the decisions to the editor make changes and submit to different journals, make no changes and submit to a different journal, or never resubmit the paper to anywhere. So these are all up to you at the end of the day. And another takeaway from me um, to uh, early career researcher, particularly for graduate students, uh, is to consider whether you want to be in this journey alone or you want someone to encourage you or at least like pat your shoulder and say everything will be all right, uh, maybe you, you need to consider this. Whether you want to publish your paper alone or with someone more experienced, well, if I could turn back time, to be honest, I would definitely consider writing up something with my PhD supervisors or my peers. Um, and for our uh, early career researcher, uh, I feel like as an early career researcher, I realized that what is as important as the authorship of the paper, the ownership of the paper, is the fact that I am emotionally healthy enough to carry on this up and down journey and do not give up in the middle of it after like few rejections or reading three pages long comments suggesting a major revision. And these are all I can share to you uh, from my very limited experience of submitting paper and within 15 minutes. Uh, and I feel like uh, what I'm sharing with you within these 15 minutes, uh, as those who've been through up and down, actually more down than up, could do some good for you. Mm. And I wish everyone a smooth ride on this journey. Have a successful uh, submission, everyone. Thank you for listening. Ajahn Pritaya, thank you very much. When I visit Thailand next time, let's meet and have lunch and you can tell me everything. Okay. Not just in 15 Definitely. minutes, <laughs> but in one whole hour. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, another big hand please for Professor Pritaya. Uh, clap, 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 yes. 
And uh, we will now be looking at some questions from the audience. Uh, there is one here that is of interest to me because I don't know uh, the answer to that. Uh, the question is addressed to Larry, actually. But the other uh, speakers can also help respond to this question. Uh, the question has to do with linear and non-linear papers. Uh, I'm not very clear what, what non-linear and linear papers uh, are, ab uh, are about. Uh, which one is more publishable? I think that is the question from the, uh, from the person. Linear paper and non-linear paper. Could, could the uh, yeah. person who raised the question clarify what is linear paper and what is a non-linear paper? Uh, that might be a little bit difficult because it was a question from uh, one of the, the uh, members of the audience from YouTube actually. Not from mm. the chat box, yeah. Oh, okay then. Okay. I mean, I don't know what, what the person means, but I think mm. probably uh, he is asking questions about whether the paper is a qualitative, relatively thin paper mm -hmm. or a quantitative, uh, methodologically speaking. Mm. Uh, I guess that could have been what uh, the person was referring to. Yeah. Uh, system welcomes submissions that use any methodological um, choice. Now, the methodology must rigor, but as long as the methodology is rigor, the reporting follows the standard procedure of, for example, qualitative paper writing, what details the thickness of data that you want to put into your description. Mm. The reviewers are anticipating what they want to see then editors will make decisions based on reviewers' recommendations. Unless the papers are really poorly crafted, for example, language is full of errors, which show the author's lack of attentiveness to, or even interest in the academic discipline. Mm -hmm. If that's the paper, editors feel that you are not responsible for your own work. Why should I waste the time mm -hmm. of the reviewers? I mean, you mm -hmm. as the author, that should have spent a lot of time preparing the manuscripts, although typo errors could have, a, have happened, but there shouldn't be the frequent yeah. uh, sentence errors, mm. grammatical errors, uh, spelling errors throughout the, the paper. That could yeah. make the person feel very much frustrated and the editor wouldn't want to read the paper anymore, although the quality of the work is good. But mm. on a positive note, by the way, System has put on the website a new initiative which is to help those authors who are in the underrepresented regions mm. around the world. Mm. If your paper is not really well written, but has very good ideas, one of the editors is going to help you, mm. or one of the editorial board members, senior mm. colleagues would be co-authoring with you to help you get it published in the end. But again, the paper will be handled by another editor that it will go through the blind review. Mm. It doesn't mean that one of the editors or one of the editorial board members is going to help you, mm. meaning that you are going to definitely get accepted. That is not the case. It has still to go through the blind review process, mm. but it, if it survives the review, yeah. then the paper is going to be published. That's a new initiative that is going to be implemented. Okay. That's, that's really nice, uh, a very nice uh, initiative uh, from system. Uh, another question has to do with desk rejection. Uh, when you when you when you reject uh, papers on that basis, do you actually read the whole paper, or do you just look at the abstract, or maybe just the title, or all of the above? Uh, Marie, I see, I see, and Marie could. Okay, I, yeah, um, I see, and Marie. Yes. Um, I, I actually answered that in the chat box. Um, at RELT, we don't mm. actually do desk rejections at the minute um, mm. because we're really trying to um, encourage our writers. Every article will be reviewed by at least two RELC reviewers. And mm. of course, we read the whole article. Uh, we even give you feedback because it's part of our mission to support um, teachers yeah. to be researchers. So that's the mm. reason we do that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, I see. Any perspective on that? Uh, you are mute. I see. You are mute. Yeah. 
Yes, good. Okay, all right. At JSLW, we do ju just reject papers, mm -hmm. but we don't just read the abstract. We read uh, the abstract, the paper, and we try our best to offer at least one or two paragraphs of comments or suggestions mm -hmm. so that the author can also learn something from our feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, a question now for maybe for Christine. Uh, you know, tenure track faculty members, they're always worried about the number of papers that they need to get published every year. So essentially, if you just have one paper every year, that is probably considered not enough. And you may not be able to make it when your, you know, tenure clock, you know, is mm -hmm. coming to an end. Mm -hmm. So, so what kind of advice do you, would you give to, you know, junior faculty members who need to get maybe two or three papers published every year. Maybe not three, maybe two. <laughs> but one, okay, one definitely yeah. is not enough. I mean, you need two yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the expectations for promotion and tenure are different for different universities. Yeah. So clearly you need to find out what is expected. Mm. But uh, for me, also from my own experience, is that I, I am not a linear writer. I write one or two or sometimes three papers at the same time, but they're all at different stages mm -hmm. because uh, that to me would ensure that there's a pipeline of um, articles to be submitted. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you are fortunate, the two of them may get accepted and accepted in the same year. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a very unfortunate situation, you may not get anything accepted for that year, but you will get something down the road, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the short answer is um, have a few pieces and mm. work on them at different stages. Mm. Is that something that you that is happening at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, or maybe at Tamasat University? We have Professor Supong here, who is also in charge of tenure as well. Mm. Some of his faculty members. <laughs> yes, I see uh, Larry, perhaps Auckland University and Chinese University of Hong Kong. What is the uh, because publication eventually is closely associated with tenure. Yeah. That's right. yeah, but at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, we don't really tell colleagues how many papers they should mm. aim at publishing per year. Okay. Actually, I put this question to my provost when I first became department chair and I asked him, what if my colleagues ask me how many? He said, yeah. don't answer this kind of question, <laughs> right? So we look at both quantity and quality. Mm. Quality is also very important. Mm. So I have to say, I don't tell my colleagues how many, but mm. as Christine has said, I think it's a good idea to aim at about two per year. Mm. Yeah, mm. two good papers per year. Okay. Yeah. Larry, same thing at that, Auckland that University. Is, that, that is almost the same as what we are mm. anticipated uh, to produce uh, per year for um, academic uh, staff members who start their career as junior colleagues who mm. are looking for a four year uh, tenure clock to get confirmation to become really the full-time uh, mm. permanent employee. So I think mm. two papers per year is quite a fair requirement mm. for new members of staff because otherwise within four years you won't be able to produce the number of uh, journal articles or peer-reviewed publications. Yes. But I think IC is, is uh, also uh, right. Um, Christine has raised the point about how many Mm. And not really about the, the number, it's the quality. Mm -hmm. So Christine emphasized the quality. My strategy for my younger colleagues is that if you really want to get a tenure, for example, mm. the number is important at the earlier stage of your career. But once you get your tenure, and that's the time that you should really focus mm. on quality rather than quantity. Mm. Because one paper that is really quite an influential one could make an impact. And some people haven't published a lot, but they become well known in the field, mm. right? If you publish 20 papers per year in very low, um, not just ranked, but they are really journals that nobody reads. Mm. Then those journals that charge fees, for example, yeah. the predatory journals, they yes. charge you 200 US dollars. They say you submit it within two months, I'll get your paper printed and, mm. and published online. It's, it's not about two months, it's two weeks only yeah. now. Two weeks, right. <laughs> so that kind of publication, nobody would read. Yes. 
And in the end, the university does not recognize the value of your research yeah. output either. Mm. Okay. So we have to be very careful, young, uh, mm. early career researchers, you have to mm. be very careful about where your paper goes, yes. because you know, mm. you spend so much time writing, conceptualizing, writing, and in the end, it's published mm. in the journal that nobody yeah. reads and nobody recognizes. Mm. Yes. Can I just add something? Yeah, uh, to, to yes, pick up Kristen. the point on quantity and quality, really, at the end mm. of the day, it's quality mm -hmm. and how the impact of your work uh, mm. comes across. Yeah, mm. so absolutely don't. I mean, I would encourage young younger colleagues, don't try to, you know, shoot for lots and lots of different articles, collaborate with A, collaborate with B. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you don't have a coherent body of work to show. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Christine, yeah. collaborating with A and then B mm. and C yeah. and D. And I'm seeing this trend, unfortunately, among mm. some young yeah. scholars. And you think that, oh, they have to write to this scholar, scholar A, okay, can I write with you? Sometimes I receive this sort of uh, invitation from mm. someone I, I hardly know. Mm. So is I'm also mixed. Should I help? Should I not mm. help? But mm. I don't know that person that well, right? So. Mm. I think, um, yeah, develop a research agenda for yourself. You've got a niche, an area you want yeah. to develop and develop this research agenda and have a piece, a few pieces of um, good writing on this topic. And then you can, you know, yeah, make an impact through your work. Yeah. 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 Okay, let, let me just take it one step further. When we talk about quality, how do we measure quality actually? If you publish your paper in a top tier journal, like, you know, uh, the Journal of Second Language Writing or System or the RLC Journal, how do you know that it has impact? Because very often impact is measured quantitatively by number of citations. And number of citations takes forever. You know, it takes years and years for you to accumulate number of citations. So what is quality uh, from the point of view of, of people who are in a position to assess whether a paper has quality? I, I know that's a difficult question. I think to be able to get into a good journal and be published in, you know, like the journals we're talking about here yes. is itself an indication of the quality of the work. Yes. And you're absolutely right. Uh, I don't think we should expect young uh, academics to have really high citations because citations takes years. And then after a while, maybe it has a tipping point and it takes off. Mm. Um, so, you know, in the first two years, I, I would think that that shouldn't really be a way of um, um, holding our younger colleagues accountable. I, I want to pick up a sub slightly different point because uh, Prachaya mentioned earlier about encouraging mm. PhD candidates to start publishing. Mm. I think that's an excellent piece of advice. Yeah. yeah, you should start publishing from the, the first set of preliminary findings. Of course, you, mm -hmm. you have to position it differently, but that will also give you time to accumulate some of these metrics if, if metrics is important but mm. if not just for the experience and building mm. up the body of work yeah yeah mm -hmm. so what advice you know can you all give to uh, maybe young researchers you know about choosing the journal to publish you know that paper thing because you know they may not be aware of uh, some predatory of journals right actually there are lots of them now so how can they choose how should they choose you know the right mm. journals Okay. Can I say, uh, oh, yes, Larry, go ahead. Larry, go ahead. Larry, oh. go ahead. I, I receive almost every day an email to say that do you want to have your paper published in your journal? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. they ask yeah. me to, yeah. to 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 give a paper that so your your impact is, and you know there there's a lot of words in in description of what the journal is all about. But if you click on the link, you realize that the journal is not a reputable journal. How do I know? Either it's just launching, no one is interested in contributing or it has collected some articles. If you click on the link and open the articles, you realize the articles are not really good articles. That's one way to make the judgment. The, the way the articles uh, are presented, the format, the content, as well as the topic or the topics that are covered in the journal. All these, in addition to these indexes, I think the immediate question is, do you charge a fee? Mm -hmm. Because reputable journals in the professional publishing industry do not charge fees, mm. except only a few, two or three journals in science and psychology, mm. they do charge fees, but they go through the rigorous review process. It takes at least half a year or three months minimum to get the review done. But 
predatory journals, as really said, you submitted our turnout rate is very fast. Within two weeks, your paper will be published. We know that's unrealistic. We know that's cheating. We know that's a way of getting your money out of your pocket in order to get them rich, but you will be basically wasting your human, your, your int intellectual input in such a, a platform that, that really downgrades your reputation in the long run. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Larry has said what I wanted to say, but to add to that, I think it's a good idea for early career researchers and PhD students to develop a sense of judgment um, by browsing the journal websites, really reading the information, finding out A, the publisher, is El Sophia, Sage, or Taylor and Francis, or other good publishers, um, look at the editorial board members, who the editors are, who the EB members are, and look at the articles published and develop a sense. I think um, at some point, early career researchers have to be independent. You, can, you cannot always turn to Larry, Marie, or different people and say, hey, tell me which is a good journal. So we've got to develop this sense of judgment and independence, I think. So I encourage scholars to really browse the journal websites. Yeah. yeah. Okay. May I add something as well? Yes. Um, uh, like on top of developing a sense of judgment, particularly for, for early career researcher, we always actually deep down, we know ourselves that we are very newbie in the field. We just like only step one foot into the field. Mm -hmm. And if one day you got an invitation email mm -hmm. from a journal, mm -hmm. please be skeptical. Like mm -hmm. these, these email will sound like you are someone uh -huh. inviting you to publish your paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't fall into all these words you know yourself you know who you are you just you just are very newbie in the field but so it's very tempting in, isn't it yeah, yeah. It's tempting, isn't it when people say professor yes. so and so you are an expert in this area yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. just be skeptical yes and be realistic Mm. Yeah. Yes, I, yes. I'd like to add that, you know, I think um, there's a bit of honesty involved and there are no shortcuts. Mm. Um, I think everyone who's tried to publish, we know how much work it is mm. and what it feels like to get rejection. So if you're being offered a shortcut, you really need to think about it. And I also wanted to answer the question, how do we tell uh, what is a good journal? Actually, uh, Willie Renandia, you've written some excellent articles. Yeah. Uh, what are bogus journals and why we should avoid them? And choosing mm -hmm. the right international journal in TESOL and applied linguistics. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would encourage participants to read some of um, these articles because it tells you clearly some red flags mm -hmm. um, for you to identify bogus journals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, one, one, maybe one last point for the uh, panel to consider. I think this is related to what Christian mentioned uh, in one of her slides about right, right, and right, which reminds me of what a, 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 a renowned novelist, uh, Ernest Hemingway, said many mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, I write every morning, mm -hmm. every single day. Is that mm -hmm. what you do? Uh, I see. Is that what you do, Larry? Is that what you do, Marie? Christian? Uh, Pri, Dr. Supong, do you write every day? Is that how you develop expertise in the area of writing? I mean, this will be a very good piece of advice for people who want to get started on their publication career. Do we need to write every day? Let me start first, and I'm sure the others want to chime in. Um, I think, ideally, you should write in a sustained manner. Mm. Whether it's every day or over the long weekend, uh, it doesn't matter. It really depends on your, your schedule, right? But some sustainability needs to be there. Mm. And I think this is also where early uh, career academics can make use of the time that you have. Um, mm. Start building up your writing from this stage. Because as you rise through the years and you become more and more senior, there will be a lot of other things that you may have to do take on leadership responsibilities, take care of, you know, the departments and so on. And you'll find that you may not have that luxury of writing every day. Mm. But, you, uh, but at the end of the day, we still need to find a, sustain, a way of sustaining the writing. Yeah. Mm. Totally good. Okay. Now for PhD students and early career researchers, I strongly suggest you read and write every day. It's not just okay. write, but read and write every day. 
I often find that if you can read something and then think about it, reflect on it and write something, it need not be something really academic. It can be mm. something relating to your reflection or your, your personal thoughts on, on something. Then you build, develop this good writing habit and reading habit as well. Mm. Yeah. I cannot afford to do this myself, sorry. So I'm just suggesting those who have time, like PhD students, for example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Larry? I think continuous writing is important. Uh, I think mm. different authors or different writers have different preferences. Some people say that in the whole week, do not open your email at all. Oh, but right. I can't do it. You know, I can't do it. I cannot. Oh. I simply cannot survive without looking at the email yeah. because I want to solve the nitty gritty details of job that requires my attention before I can really go on to write my own papers. Mm. So to me, it's a very different writing style. Probably the working style of mine is different from some others. So mm. we ourselves, I think, should look for our own niche as if, you know, the, the, the strength that we have. And some people cannot write mm. in discontinuous manners, but I can. I can mm. write a small paragraph and stop. And another day I can continue another small paragraph. Mm. But some people cannot do it. They, they say, no, 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 I mm. must continue, continue my writing today. I said, sometimes I get stuck. If I sit there, I have no ideas to come for me to use, in the end, I'm wasting my time. Why shouldn't I just do my email? And then when a new idea comes, I'll continue my writing. Mm -hmm. So I think different writers have their different preferences. Mm -hmm. I would like to mm -hmm. respect individual yes. variation yeah. in mm -hmm. the writing practice. Yes. Ajahn, yeah. Ajahn Priya, do you need three months holiday to, you know, <laughs> for you to spend writing? <laughs> well, actually, I cannot like effort doing writing every day but mm. on top of like all the valuable suggestion is that when you write something uh sometimes you have to stop and doing something else and go back to your <laughs> writing mm. and read and you will find like rooms for improvement every time mm. so that's it's what worked for me as a like newbie in the field of writing yeah mm. I, I like Christine's idea. Uh, I mean, if you, uh, as a earlier career um, mm -hmm. academic staff member, I think if you really want to meet the requirements of quantity as well as quality, if you say, let me finish this paper, get it published, and think of another paper, that is not enough. That is really too late. Mm -hmm. That's too late because the, mm -hmm. the turnout rate, let's think about the turnout rate. Right, the turnout rate you see yeah. that the system is relatively fast. Yeah. REOC is fast. JSLW is really the fastest. Yeah. But not many journals are working yeah. as hard as we are working. Yeah. The duration can be very long. You waited yeah. six months mm -hmm. and then the rejection yeah. later comes. Yes. And then you have to think about where to sub submit it. Yeah. You submit it to another yeah. journal, another yeah. five months is gone. So I yeah. think multitasking, uh, on working on maybe two or three drafts, at yes. different stages, would it be a working strategy that mm -hmm. young scholars need to adopt rather than finishing one, then think about another. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really a yes. big time gap mm -hmm. or a time lag you, you cannot really feel. Yes, uh, I, th I, think, I think, yes, I agree with that. Uh, essentially, in any one year, you need to get at least one paper already accepted, one mm -hmm. paper under review, and one other paper you know being written or something along that line mm -hmm. so in that way you can at least get at least one paper published every year mm -hmm. if you're lucky too uh i think we are now approaching the end our of our session uh this morning ajan supong yes. any closing remark any thank you notes to the panel and to the audience yeah just many thanks you know to our our uh, speakers today right and so i hope that you know the uh, participants you know are still hopeful, you know when they want you know to send their manuscripts okay to the uh, mainstream journals okay so we have learned a lot okay from all of you today okay from all the editors and you know from the researchers right who are in our field so I, I believe that you know even though it's difficult it's now difficult right you know to get published you know in mainstream journals it's still doable. Right, so I think the experience you know, should not be too undaunting, right? And we need to keep trying. Yes, 
thank you again, right? And thank hope you. that you thank know you. we will stay in touch, right? And thank maybe you. we can meet thank again you. You know, for further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. 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 Hope, hope Bye. to see you in person sometime. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You will definitely Bye. see me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Bye. thank you again. Uh, audience, thank you very much for joining us yes. this morning. We'll Bye. see you again you. in another webinar. Yes. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.